Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you to Philippa for inviting me to speak today. I'm just going to talk, it's a very short talk, it's just I'm going to give you a brief um, overview of some of the work we're doing at Greater Wellington in air quality monitoring, um, the main pressures on air quality and some sort of future aspirations. So just to put everything in, in um, context, um, we're a regulatory authority at Greater Wellington and we have sort of th uh, three main drivers which focuses what we actually um, do our monitoring on and how we manage air quality. We've got national environmental standards which are from central government and they, are giving, uh, they provide the mandatory minimum standards for air quality that we need to measure compliance with. Um, PM10 um, is the main focus of those standards. We have our proposed natural resources plan under the Resource Management Act and that directs us how we're going to manage air quality, what the rules are for industrial premises. And we have a, um, a new um, objective that's come out which is requiring us to manage air quality to a higher standard than perhaps which is in the nat natural environmental standards, but this has not yet been um, ratified. And then we have the Regional Land Transport Plan. Um, the latest iteration now has a target for uh, reduced harmful uh, pollutants from transport and that's with um, one of our monitoring focuses now. So just um, quickly, uh, wood smoke from home fires, it's one of the main pressures of um, PM10 and PM2.5 emissions. Uh, these are uh, fine particles produced uh, when wood is burnt and other fossil fuels. Um, main issues are in areas where you've got a high density of wood burning and that's combined with um, where you've got unfavourable meteorology or topography um, allowing sort of sheltered valley, valley areas where you get temperature inversions and the wood smoke builds up overnight and um, doesn't disperse easily. So I'm just going to quickly show you, this is our um, core monitoring network. We've got five um, stations, five locations, um, mainly in the Hutt Valley, Wainuamata, um, Masterton and one in Wellington. And at all these sites we comply with the PM10 standard apart from um, Masterton. Just delving in a little bit deeper, um, looking at PM2.5, although we're not required to monitor PM2.5, we decided to add it into our network about five years ago because PM2.5 is more closely associated with um, adverse health effects than PM10. And I'm just going to show you some data from um, We've actually got two monitoring stations in Masterton. I know it sounds like overkill, but the top one is on the west side, and that's our long-term trend station. We've been monitoring there um, since 2003, and that tells us how air quality is changing. The second site, which is um, on the east side of town, is our compliance monitoring site, and that's where we get the highest levels of air particulate. And under the National Environmental Standard, we're required to monitor where air quality is worse, hence the second station. So this is just a snippet of some results from last year. This shows um, PM2.5 daily average, and I've just popped in the WHO, the World Health Organization guideline, the daily guideline. So we can see we're getting frequent exceedances of that guideline, particularly at the um, site, uh, the lower site there. Uh, we had 43 exceedances there last year. Uh, we know that Ministry for the Environment is reviewing um, the national standard for PM10 with a view to including PM2.5. So we're geared up and ready for that. Now we've got wood smoke. You've also got other um, air toxics that are um, co-emitted. Um, we've got arsenic from burning of treated timber. We've got lead from burning old um, painted wood and other organic compounds that um, are naturally produced by wood like benzoopyrene. So I'm just going to show some data quickly here. This is from Wainuamata. It was a couple of years ago. Um, you can see the winter periods, the, those spikes there, that's um, daily arsenic levels. So this goes to show that despite this airshed complying with uh, the PM10 standard and pretty much the 2.5 um, guideline as well, we're still getting elevated levels of other air toxics, which means you, don't, you have to manage for multi-pollutants. You can't just focus on meeting the mass standard for, for a particular matter. Um, I'm just, here's, here's just some trends. I'm just looking at the um, annual, uh, the winter average for PM10. This is in some of our sites, Masterton, Wainuamata, and you can see 
There's sort of a gradual, been a gradual decline um, in PM levels over the winter period, uh, which is good. And in fact, it's sort of influencing this trend as a general population shift away from po solid fuels that we're seeing through the census data. Less so in Masterton, but more so in the other areas like Upper Hutt and Wainua Mata. We also see that there's a bit of variation there from year to year, and a lot of that's due to the meteorological conditions. In 2015, we had one of our really low air pollution years, and, um, but that coincided with a very windy winter um, coming off the back of a very strong El Nino. So there are some sort of variation in the trend due to climate patterns. Um, so on to my second um, pressure, and that is uh, impacts of traffic. Um, this is the most significant source of NOx, nitrogen um, dioxide, and is much more variable than PM10 and PM2.5. Um, even streets right next to each other can be quite different depending on the local characteristics. So we need to better understand the um, patterns of what's happening with NO2 to order to report on our new regional land transport um, outcome of reduced harmful emissions. So we're using NO2 as a proxy for that. So at the moment we've got one central monitoring site. Um, this is a reference station measuring everything at high um, accuracy and in accordance with standard methods. Multi-pollutants there. This is on um, if you exit from the terrace as you're going towards the um, south of the city, we're just on the left there. And this is giving us very, very valuable data on how all these different pollutants vary with different traffic um, impacts. And what we're finding is that the nitrogen oxides, the carbon monoxide and the black carbon really closely follow the traffic uh, trends. They're very good indicators, whereas the particles um, don't really follow the traffic um, patterns because they come from a wide variety of sources that are not traffic related. So, obviously one station can't represent a region, so we're very fortunate that NZTA already has quite a well established um, network, national network measuring NO2, and it's measuring it using these passive diffusion tubes, which are absolutely brilliant. Um, you put one out uh, for a month on a street pole, after a month you cap it up, you send it away for analysis and you replace it with another tube, and this gives us a um, a uh, monthly average for nitrogen dioxide, which we can then average up to make an annual average. And it's a very, very reliable, very low cost um, method. So what we've done is we've added in about 20 additional tube sites to the existing sites that NZTA already has in our region. And with some help from NEWA, um, we now have a site classification system. So we have the peak sites and the inner city built up areas. Uh, then we have the roadside sites. We've got sort of high volumes of traffic, but not state highways, which is the focus of NZTA's network. And then we've got our urban background sites. And these are the low volume roads. This is where most people live, where they get most of their exposure. So we wanted to have a way of comparing apples with apples so we could disaggregate the data. We could look at what's happening in the trends and peak sites, what's happening in our roadside sites, urban background, and how this differs across the region, because we have sites now, these tube sites, all the way from Kapiti and the Wairapa, Porirua, areas where we don't actually have a lot of monitoring normally. So I'm just going to quickly show you um, the first year worth of results. We've actually been progressively installing these tubes over the last 18 months. Um, so we're now in a position to have a baseline for the region, which we can then, um, as we add on data, we'll be able to do trends on that. So um, looking at the sort of annual average, what we're finding is a peak sites, average of all the peak sites is about roughly about three times higher than what you're getting in the urban background. The roadside sites are about uh, twice as high. And so moving forward, we'll be able to analyse this data in lots of different ways to see how the trends, whether the trends are changing in different parts. Is Hutt City showing a different trend than Wellington City? It's going to be um, an absolutely marvellous data set. And we're very grateful to NZTA for their assistance with this. So I'm just going to show you the data in another way. Um, this is, I've just mapped up the annual averages for last year based on the tube data. And this, this tube data does, it is read higher than the reference method, so we can't really compare it to the guidelines, even though I've, I've put it up, I've put the 40 there, which is the WHO annual guideline. So these sites up here, these are all um, uh, north of Tiaro, these are all sites that we've put in, and these sites here are the existing NZTA sites. 
And what is interesting is um, I've just looked at NZTA has some data um, going back to 2010 for some of these sites. So I just had a quick look at some of the uh, trends at those sites. And we're actually getting quite diverging trends um, from sites within the same sort of area, which is really interesting. Um, at the Basin Reserve, uh, over the last sort of um, eight years, we can see air quality is, is getting worse. Probably no surprise to people who live in Wellington with the congestion happening there. The new town trend, um, it's remained elevated the whole time. We haven't really had any uh, decrease or increase. But for the Island Bay, where we've got an urban background, low volume roads, we've had an improving trend, although that's been quite static for the last um, four years or so. So we're looking at building in more um, sort of covariates to this indicator, collecting more traffic data, so we can actually try and explain some of these trends. So that's all about um, air quality, and I just want to quickly finish off with, um, you know, obviously it gets a bit pedestrian, we're just doing monitoring, so what. Um, sort of, I want, you know, I've got some ideas of um, how to take the things further. We actually want to look at this distributed networks, putting in more different pollutants. Um, we've had so much success with the NO2 one, but we're just waiting for technology um, to become available, to be reliable, and, um, cost effective. Um, public engagement, involvement in citizen science is a very important area that our council is getting into, mainly in the moment in the water quality space, but we're, it would be great to include air in that. Well, um, our council is also looking at some behaviour change um, programs for improving burning practice, eliminating uh, burning of treated timber, because although it's now banned in our new plan, we actually can't really enforce it practically. So we've got work coming on in that space. And then um, I'm always interested in how we can, how our data can be used by others for exposure studies or health impact studies. So um, that would be my dream. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much for being here. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Kia ora, mori ora, kia tato. Um, it's a real pleasure. I want to thank Philippa and Libby for organizing and the Center for Sustainability Studies for having me. Uh, for people who don't know me, this is my fourth extended stay in the Wellington area over the last 20 years. So I really consider uh, this my second home. Um, I also want to acknowledge my Detroit partners. Um, as others have heard me say, normally I would be co-presenting with a, someone from Detroit who would love to be here, but I haven't figured out the resources to bring them here yet, so maybe, uh, maybe the next time. Um, and as part of that acknowledgement, um, these are some of my co-authors on the, some of the presentation today. Uh, I've been able to share slides with me that I'm part of that team. So just want to acknowledge them and, and their contributions to this work. So I want to start by, and again, apologies to a few folks who heard me present about a week or two ago. I have about five of the same slides. I promise that's it. Uh, and then I'll go into a whole nother presentation. Uh, but just wanted to start by talking a little bit about the way we do the work that we do in the city of Detroit. Uh, we use something called a community-based participatory research approach. It's not a new approach to research. It's got other labels, participatory research, action research, and so forth. Uh, we choose to call it CBPR. Uh, we'll provide definitions and principles and then want to give a case example of the work that we're doing, particularly as it relates to air quality um, and some of the policy translation work that uh, Philippa uh, referred to. So first of all, CBPR is a partnership approach to research uh, that equitably involves all partners um, in all aspects of the research process. So the emphasis here is on, in our instance, we involve community partners, NGOs, we involve community individuals, we involve uh, health and human services, government agencies, as well as academic researchers as part of our partnerships. Uh, and heavy emphasis on equity uh, enables all partners to contribute their expertise to the process, share responsibility, share ownership. Um, and the focus is enhancing both understanding of the given phenomena, so this is research, it is basic research, but it's also using that research to bring about change. Um, so in balancing that research and action is a big part of CBPR. Um, so let me just say a little bit about some of the key principles. First of all, it is a, recognizes community as a unit of identity. And by unit of identity, I'm talking about you're working with communities where there's a shared value system, shared norm, shared history, a common sense of, of ownership and identification of 
issues uh, and a desire for people to work together, a history of having worked together. So you're really starting with that community of identity. It may be a geographic neighborhood, but it doesn't have to be. It could be something around ethnicity or some other kind of value, core value. Um, secondly, it builds on community strengths and resources. So very importantly is recognizing that all the communities work with, while they may have challenges, may face health inequities and so forth, that they also have a strong sense of, of resources related to social networks, personal relationships, families, et cetera, uh, and building on those strengths and resources. Third is promoting collaborative uh, and equitable partnerships. Um, again, it's about really power sharing uh, and recognizing, certainly from an academic standpoint, which is the standpoint I come from, uh, we have more access to resources in our community partner organizations too. And so how do you, from the get-go, uh, talk about and genuinely share that, those power and resources? Uh, it facilitates co-learning and capacity building. Here again, I often hear my academic colleagues say, you know, the community needs its capacity built. Uh, well, we would articulate that so do the academic colleagues, that I have a lot to learn from my Detroit partners about what it's like to live in Southwest Detroit, a predominantly Latino community. It's not my community of origin. I don't know a lot about that. And so recognizing that it, the capacity building is on both uh, perspectives, all partners. Balances research and action for mutual benefit. Again, it is about research, it is about science, but what do you do with that information? What do you do with that, those findings, that knowledge to bring about change? And lastly, disseminating findings to all partners and including them in the dissemination process. So as co-authors, as co-presenters, as I was alluding to before. So the Detroit Urban Community Academic Urban Research Center, which is a mouthful, so we call it the Detroit URC for short, um, is a long-standing partnership. It was established in 1995 uh, with a number of community-based organizations that I'll say more about in just a minute. But our overarching goal is really to try to foster collaborative research in the city of Detroit uh, aimed at better understanding and addressing the social and physical environmental determinants of health inequities. Um, this is a list of all our partner organizations. There, uh, there's a local health department, there's a, a large integrated care system, uh, nine community-based organizations, which is similar to your NGOs, um, and the university, several units at the university. And importantly, from my perspective, a number of these NGOs, they are not health direct specific. So they may be working on gang violence, or they may be working on housing issues, which of course we in public health see as, as health issues, right? But when we first approached a number of these partners to become potential partners, they said, you know, why us? We don't do health care. And so it's taken a long time to get people to understand that public health is not, quote, just about health care. That certainly can be a piece of it. Um, so our, again, partner organizations represent quite a diverse uh, set of entities and issues and what we try to do is, what do we have in common and how do we work together? Um, so another, the board is, uh, we have a number of affiliated partnerships because that's what we've been about is trying to create those partnerships. So we see this as the umbrella, the URC is the umbrella partnership and within that are a number of uh, CBPR partnerships. The one I'm gonna focus on today, CAFE, Community Approaches to Promoting Healthy Environments but others that have focused on asthma, diabetes, uh, cardiovascular disease, again, some of the things that Philippa mentioned. Each of these uh, partnerships has its own steering committee, its own governing body. Uh, we at the URC board level don't tell other <laughs> partnerships what to do. We really try to facilitate the work that they're doing and support that work. So just quickly, a couple of us, some of the overall accomplishments and then wanna focus in on CAFE. Uh, we've established 10 CBPR partnerships and over 35 research projects, uh, working on, again, the number of issues I talked about. Um, several of our partnerships and projects have been intervention research, uh, staggered design, randomized controlled trials, and we've been able to show improvement in health status. For example, uh, body mass index, reduction in blood glucose levels, uh, blood pressure, and so forth. I'm not gonna talk about those projects today, per se. Uh, we've increased capacity to engage in policy advocacy, resulting in policy change. One of the things we've done a lot of is actually training local residents to engage in policy advocacy and take some of the research findings that the partnerships have come up with and then uh, meet with decision makers, policy makers to try to bring about change. We've hired over 400 community members for full and part-time positions. 
Uh, we built new relationships again, importantly, what our community partners say to us, this is the longest standing partnership between the African American and Latino communities in the city of Detroit. Prior to that, there's been little uh, collaboration between those two communities and certainly between the university and the community. Um, just so folks know, um, the city of Ann Arbor, where I live, is an hour from the city of Detroit. They are two totally different worlds. Uh, there hadn't been a lot of history, uh, good history, I should say, positive history of uh, the university being in the city of Detroit. Um, and our originally, initially, understandably, the partners that we approached were very skeptical about why we were there and what we planned to do and how was it going to benefit the community. Um, so it, it took a while, I don't have time today to go into that, but to, just to establish that kind of relationships and trust to be able to do what we're now doing. Okay, so let me just say a little bit, before I look at some of the issues that CAFE is talking about, I think Detroit as a city, uh, certainly in the United States, but I understand nationally and internationally, it gets a lot of bad press. Uh, all you have to do is say you're affiliated with Detroit and somebody says something negative. Uh, so I just wanted to share a little bit about the strengths and resources that exist in the city uh, because it's an incredibly resilient uh, community in, in spite of all the, the challenges that it's faced over the last few decades. Um, so quickly, some of these pictures on the left-hand side, and we've been involved with some of these walking groups um, to set them up that we're focused on um, group cohesion, social support, safety issues, walking in groups, and again, seen a lot of changes as a result of um, literally <laughs> over a thousand people involved and in now training of trainers to set up other walking groups throughout the city. Uh, the middle upper picture is one of our partnership meetings that we meet monthly. Um, the, the other picture below of housing. Uh, Detroit is um, the footprint of Detroit. You could fit the city of Manhattan, Boston, and Seattle within the footprint of the city of Detroit. It's 139 square miles. It's huge. Uh, the population used to be 1.8 million at its largest. It's now under 700,000. And so we now have a lot of vacant land, a lot of vacant houses, but historically it is a city of single family housing um, rather than high rises the way one may often think about cities um, and so forth. And, and these brick houses are an example. Um, and then there's a lot of advocacy work and community organizing work and a lot of youth organizing, which is what some of these pictures uh, capture. Um, again, on the far left-hand side, one of our partner organizations does uh, an urban, an entrepreneurial program with youth around urban arts. Uh, there's are some photos of some of our community-based organizations. And then given a lot of the vacant land that exists, uh, there's been a major push in the last uh, decade around urban gardens and urban farming. Uh, that some of those pictures capture. Um, and then lastly, the also around the built environment, um, I, I must say, and just to remind you, Detroit is the motor city. Uh, we don't have a good history of walking. Uh, you're supposed to, everybody's supposed to have a car and get around in cars. We don't have good mass transit either. And so one of the things that has come up more recently is creating uh, greenways or walking paths, um, and then we've been trying to get people, encouraging people to use them. Um, so that's been a major change in the city. Okay, so some of the strengths and resources. Now I'd like to turn and talk about community approaches to promoting healthy environments, which um, again, we refer to CAFE. I don't know what we'd all do without acronyms, right? Um, and first of all, it builds on three long-standing CBPR partnerships. So the Detroit URC is a partner of CAFE, as are HEP and CAAA, two of our other affiliated partnerships. Um, we have a heavy emphasis as a CBPR partnership on equitable engagement of the community and academic partners in all phases of the work we do. Um, and we've really been about, this builds on 10 years of prior research around air quality. So I was appreciated all the monitoring data and so forth. I'm not gonna be presenting those results today because what I wanna talk about is we've taken those results and then engaged in the community process to try to make sense of the results and prioritize action. So that's the piece that I'm gonna focus on today is our action strategies. Um, and so we increasing knowledge about air pollution, translating to a public health action plan, and then now implementing some innovative strategies to try to address, and also have been involved in evaluating our process. So these are the partner organizations of CAFE. Again, in addition to the three partnerships I mentioned, there's a number of other um, NGOs that are very active in this work. Also, uh, the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality has been involved. Um, 
And then just to take a little bit of a look in, around air quality in Detroit. Um, and historically, we've had multiple pollutant sources, uh, not dissimilar from what uh, we were just listening to. Uh, there's a large exposed population, a disproportionate uh, levels of adverse health outcomes in different parts of the city due to traffic patterns, again, as one example. Uh, these air pollutants are heavily associated with childhood asthma, cardiovascular risk, adverse birth outcomes. Um, and there's a heavy concentration of industry, particularly in one area of the city. Um, this is an example. This photograph is a playground, and if you look behind it, you see um, the AK Steel Mill. And what you can't see, but right around the corner is a major interstate highway. And they, they actually had to move the interstate because trucks literally were, I mean, they had to move the playground because trucks were literally falling onto the playground like once every six months or so because of this sharp curve in the highway. I mean, it's, it's just, but this is, um, this is southwest Detroit and uh, heavy exposure to, to air pollution. And so with all of these, um, challenges, people, uh, again, building on strengths, wanted to come together and try to do something to address them. So CAFE's overarching goals, as I mentioned, is to take scientifically informed pub um, data, use scientific data to inform a public health action plan, and then try to um, promote implementation components of the plan to bring about change, to reduce, if not reduce air pollution, to reduce, um, to mitigate the negative effects of air pollution on health. So some of the partner roles, and again, as a CBPR project, this importance of recognizing their, the community partners bring a certain area of expertise, as does the academics, and then things that we do together. Um, so the community, I won't go through all of these, but it has been actively involved in identifying uh, priority action areas for developing community and youth leadership, the academic partners conducting the background research, mapping vulnerable communities, and then jointly, uh, we've been involved in identifying public health problems, in this instance, air pollution and health, um, and coming up with a public health action plan. I'll say a little bit more about how we've been doing that. So, but before I get to that participatory process, one of the things we did together was to try to map some of the um, issues that uh, would inform the public health action plan and using uh, different data sources. Again, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here other than just to show you. This is a map of the Detroit metropolitan area, so the tri-county area. If you look in the middle, a little bit lower middle, is the black outline is the city of Detroit. Um, and the, in this particular instance, where this is, is mapping the proximity of hazardous land uses to sensitive land uses, and sensitive land uses are things like residential areas, schools, healthcare facilities. Um, and this is looked at by census tract and quintiles, uh, with yellow track showing the lowest distribution of these hazardous land uses, and red showing the highest concentrations. Uh, so you can see the city of Detroit, um, much of the city of Detroit is dark red in this instance. Again, this is hazardous facilities, hazardous land uses. So another way to look at this is environmental exposures. So in this instance, this is looking at PM, diesel PM exposure 2.5, uh, similar to what we were just talk, hearing about, and looking at cancer and respiratory risk uh, attributable to air pollution. Um, again, the red shows the highest um, exposures and health risks. Um, again, you can see heavily concentrated in the city of Detroit. Then we looked at, um, so we've looked at physical environment, well what about the social environment? What about social vulnerabilities? So what this map overlays is looking at percent people of color, percent below the poverty level, percent with less than high school graduation rates, a number of other social factors um, as it relates um, to the different areas of the tri-county. And again, you'll see um, that Detroit has pretty much the highest concentration of um, social vulnerabilities. And then lastly, with this series of analyses we did, is to develop a cumulative risk, where we're looking at the physical environment, the social environment, um, and the um, other environmental hazards, so all three of the maps that we looked at before. Um, and so it's not that Detroit has its own, <laughs> it's not the only area that has challenges, but it certainly maps on pretty strongly. Uh, some of the challenges that we face and the need to do something about them. 
So these maps just, uh, these have been very compelling to use with policymakers, um, and I'll say more about that um, in just a minute. Um, we also uh, did some uh, looking at uh, the quantifiable health impacts through modeling. And so each year in the Detroit metropolitan area, air pollution is responsible for 690 deaths, 1,800 hospitalizations and emergency room visits, thousands of missed school and work days, and the, a monetary figure being put at the cost of $6.9 billion per year. Um, and these effects occur disproportionately again in Detroit and the surrounding areas with high concentration of poverty, African American and Latino residents. One of the things I don't think I said is the city of Detroit is one of the most highly segregated cities in the United States. It is 90% uh, persons of color, uh, about 82% African American, 7% uh, Latino, and then uh, other lower percentages. Um, so at, with all of this, uh, initially, as our partnership, we developed a resource manual, uh, which contained this scientific evidence base uh, in order to inform our action planning process. Um, all of this is on our website, and I have the web link later. Um, that's really, I, I, think I can, think I can say this, even though I'm part of the team, I didn't have much to do with putting that manual together. It's pretty impressive. Um, in terms of its thoroughness and comprehensiveness of, of a lot of different data uh, that we use to then inform the development of a public health action plan. So our first step, phase then of that process, again, very participatory, um, is we met with and gathered the input from our CAFE steering committee, which again, representatives from all those partner organizations I mentioned. Um, and we started to look at the various possibilities um, and, and contributors to air pollution. So um, things like, again, diesel exhaust, point controls, where does uh, exhaust come from? Um, and this process, the, this whole process I'm talking about building up to our public health action plan took a year and a half um, of meetings and more meetings and more data uh, interpretations and so forth. Um, the second phase, um, we engaged a broader stakeholders, so not just our core steering committee, but broader stakeholders uh, and refining uh, the recommendations that we thought were important to go into the public health action plan based on everybody's collective understanding of the data, interpretation of the data. So I'm really fast forwarding all of this, uh, but glad to talk about it if people are interested. And based on that, we came up with our public health action plan, which is also on our website. Uh, and evidence-based recommendations, and we chose these areas to focus on. I'm not gonna elaborate all of them, but one of them, point source controls, which is the idea of reducing the amount of pollutants that are emitted by industry, uh, such as power plants, refineries, and so forth. Uh, we actually have had an example where the mayor of the city of Detroit, the head of the Detroit Health Department, were able to take um, data that we had collected as part of our partnership, uh, when Marathon Oil, which is a major oil refinery in the city of Detroit, uh, want, they, they literally, this is always mind-boggling to me, the refinery was making a request for a permit so they could emit more pollution. I mean, it wasn't, they weren't trying to mask that what they were doing, that's what they were requesting. Um, and the mayor and, and the health department, to our knowledge, it's the first time the mayor of the, of the city, any mayor of the city of Detroit has spoken out against Marathon Oil uh, because it's an employer and all the things that come with that. Um, and they uh, re um, pulled out their request for that uh, emission, uh, increased emission. So and again, our partners think very much so because of the data that was so compelling of what the, the risk would be by allowing them to emit even more. So that's some of the point source control work. Uh, retrofitting old diesel engines. The city has a lot of trucks that come through or are based in the city with old diesel engines, and so we're trying to do work on retrofitting those. Idling controls, it turns out we actually have an idling, anti-idling um, ordinance in the city of Detroit, but it's not uh, enforced. And so, um, and a lot, I know myself, I've learned a lot about, I used to think, you know, it's better to leave your car on than turn it off and turn it back on again. Turns out that's a myth. It's always better to turn your car off, even if you're only sitting for a minute. Um, and trucks, by all means, uh, should turn their m motors off. Um, anyway, so th that's part of the work in terms of a mitigation strategy. 
Um, actually, let me go back just a second. A couple other buffers and barriers, so doing a lot of work uh, um, to uh, build in vegetative buffers. Um, so it turns out if you have certain plants planted close to highways, they absorb some of the noxic um, substances and reduce exposures. Uh, so that's another area that we're working on. And air filters and purifiers. Um, putting air filters, particularly in schools, uh, as a way to improve the air quality and children's health. So based on this series of recommendations that are in the Public Health Action Plan, we prioritize, again, as a partnership, which ones to focus on. And in this process, again, not going to elaborate, but we, we looked at what are things that issues that other people are already working on that we might be able to work with them. Because, you know, we can't do everything ourselves. That might be a priority. What are things that it just seems so huge that we're probably not going to get any traction on? Maybe that's not a good thing to take on. Um, and what are things that, um, you know, again, we could work in partnership with others? So through a series of meetings, we prioritize these areas, and, and this is part of what we're doing today. Um, actually, maybe today, although they're sleeping at home. Um, so just a couple examples of this, uh, what we've been doing, some of our strategies. We've met uh, with policymakers. Uh, we've had a press conferences. Uh, we've done policy advocacy meetings with, uh, again, with policymakers. This particular, the picture up at the front is uh, meeting with a, um, somebody from Senator Debbie Stabenow's office and sharing information with her and listening to her talk about it. Uh, she, Debbie Stabenow is a U.S. Senator. Um, at the bottom in left, we had a press release uh, with some of the data and the Public Health Action Plan, very well attended, again, by local council. The person talking on the right is a city council person uh, in the Latino community in the city of Detroit. Um, another um, action we recently took is actually working with policymakers through a legislative luncheon. Um, and, you know, when we talk about policy, we're often talking about city policy and state policy. Um, I, I'm always jealous, Bill has heard me say this before, of, of New Zealand and the size and the scope of this country where you can talk about national policy. Um, it's it, not that you can't change national policy in the U.S., although right now, that's another story, which we won't go into uh, on videotape. But um, anyway, so we really focus at the local city level and to some extent regional and, uh, within the state and state level. So we've met with these legislators. Um, and then recently, we, uh, I missed this. It was that recent. It was in the end of April. Uh, we did a tour, a bus tour in the city of Detroit with city council persons and state legislators. And we, each of those uh, places on the map are different stopping points. We had community partners, academic partners, researchers talking about these different priority issues that I've been going over uh, with, uh, again, a series of legislative officials and are now in the process of doing follow-up meetings with them um, in terms of what they can do at their um, decision-making level. Um, and then, uh, as I referred to before, we do policy advocacy trainings, uh, working with local NGOs, uh, and this recognition that neighborhood residents themselves really need to be involved in the policy change process. So how do we help them translate the research findings? Uh, one of the things our partners often say is, you know, as a researcher, it's great that I can come in and, and um, spout out the data, but I, I'm not a constituent. I, I live an hour away. I don't even vote for local uh, uh, officials, elected officials in the city of Detroit. Whereas if a local Detroit person speaks from their heart, from their experience, from uh, living uh, and being exposed to this pollution, it's a really powerful combination to have the two of us um, speaking. Um, so that training process. Um, and then we built into our initial grant was mini grants. So we've refunded, uh, or funded, I should say, a number of community-based organizations. We did three in our initial round. We just did another eight uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, one of these groups is working on an anti-idling campaign. Another is developing a plan or policies for daycare centers to use indoor air filters. And another group is working to, to reduce emissions at a local point source in their neighborhood. So these are grants, two to $5,000, but local community groups submit the proposals. Our partnership reviews the proposals this year. We had 22 or, uh, groups submit proposals for this. And it's, it's always been humbling to me what people can do with a little bit of money um, and a lot of passion and, and good ideas and expertise. 
And then uh, pretty close to lastly here, I'm not going to say a whole lot about this, but other than to say how important it is from our perspective to evaluate our partnership process. So, uh, so not only our outcomes, but how are we doing as a partnership? Are we really being true to our principles? Um, are we power sharing? Um, do, does, do community partners feel like they have a voice? Um, and so we do both a process evaluation and an outcome evaluation and then feed that data as a formative evaluation back to the steering committee to say, what could we do be, we be doing better? Um, so with that, I think, and the signal from Libby, I'm gonna, I was just gonna say a little bit about benefits, but I'd rather us have a chance to have questions, so I'm gonna skip to the last slide, if I can get it quickly enough. Whoops, and I went too far, there we go. So I would welcome um, questions, and I don't know if we both should come up here. I'll, I'll let Philip tell us what to do. 